Good evening, everybody. Welcome to a public lecture uh, organized by the D Department of Mathematics here from the LSE. My name is uh, Jan van den Heuvel. I'm one of the, the members of the mathematics department. I was the previous head of the department, and don't ask me why, but I agreed to be the next head as well. Uh, so today's kind of uh, speaker is uh, another kind, one of my colleagues, uh, Andy Lewis Pye. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him. So Andy kind of uh, has been in the department since 2015. Let me tell a little bit what he, where he came from before. So he studied as an undergraduate in Cambridge, then did a master's in Manchester, then Believe it or not, for two years he worked as an option trader, uh, which is clearly, and then kind of went back to doing a PhD. It's clear that working as an option trader leaves you a lot of time to think or a lot of energy to think, because he then did his PhD at the University of Leeds in less than two years. Uh, he actually writes he did it in one year, but it wasn't possible, kind of bureaucratic, to do it in uh, just one year. So he had to wait two years before he could do it. Uh, after that, Andy had a couple of fellowship positions, one EPSC postdoctoral fellow in Leeds, a Macquarie fellow from the European Research Council in Siena, that might be a dying breed in this country, and then an eight-year Royal Society University fellowship uh, shared, well, part, the first half in Leeds and the second half at the LSE. Now, I, I mean, for me, and I think for some of the audience, it's very clear they know what a fellow is, but maybe some people kind of think, what is really a fellow? So let me kind of explain it as follows. Uh, a fellowship like the Royal Society Marie Curie is where you ask some rich institution, some rich organization, please give me some money so that for a couple of years I can do whatever I want. Yeah, that's in very shortly a fellowship. Now you realize that sounds very good, which means it's very competitive because everybody likes to have some money to do whatever they want for a while. So the fact that Andy had several of those and had one of them that lasted for eight years doing what he wants uh, really shows that there are other people who believed he was doing good work. Anyway, uh, since 2015 he's at the LSE. Uh, it still says there, associate professor, but it's my great pleasure that I can also let you know that from August onwards, the word associate can be removed from that, and he just has been promoted to professor in, uh, in our <laughs> department. So let me kind of stop there. Uh, Andy will talk on cryptocurrency, the issue of scalability. Uh, if anybody's live tweeting, please use the hashtag. What do I say? <laughs> the hashtag LSE Mats. Uh, the presentation will be recorded, and in a, few t in a few weeks there should be a podcast available from the LSE website. After Andy's presentation, there will be plenty of times for questions. So, kind of, uh, Andy. Hey, thanks, Jan. So, is the sound working okay? Yeah, is this, this good? Okay, good, yeah. So I'm going to talk about cryptocurrencies, right? Um, so in particular, that means I'm going to be talking about Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is presently the best known cryptocurrency. For most of the talk, though, my aim is going to be much more general than that. Okay, I'm going to talk about what cryptocurrencies are, the future of cryptocurrencies, what the present limitations are, and how those limitations might be overcome. Uh, so Bitcoin's been with us for uh, a few years now, right? It was, the network was launched in 2009 and started being reported on in the mainstream media fairly soon after that. Uh, right from the start, though, it's been fairly controversial, right? So for many people, when they first hear about Bitcoin, the immediate reaction is that this is just some sort of elaborate Ponzi scheme, right? And then at the other end of the spectrum, there are many people for whom Bitcoin is just the beginning of a decentralization revolution, right? Which is about more than just currency, which much more generally is about the control of information and who controls the information. Okay, so the basic idea there is the decentralization methods provided by Bitcoin can be applied to other contexts like the World Wide Web. Okay, and the basic aim might be to try and ensure you don't have a small number of very powerful companies controlling all of the information in ways that you know, might not be entirely transparent. Okay, 
wherever you lie on that spectrum, though, right, whether, whether you think that cryptocurrencies have significant potential applications or not, one thing we can all agree on is that Bitcoin presently has a very serious scaling problem. Okay, so what I mean by that is the following. So Visa can presently process something of the order of uh, 50,000 transactions a second when needed. Okay, Bitcoin, on the other hand, can process something like something of the order of 10 transactions a second. Okay, so you've got 10 transactions a second for Bitcoin as opposed to 50,000 transactions a second for Visa. Right, so this is a serious issue. Right, if your ambition is to create a cryptocurrency which is viable as a large scale, as a serious large scale currency, then you're going to want to see improvements in your transaction rates of several orders of magnitude. If you're more ambitious than that, if you want to see a decentralized web 3.0, then you're going to need to be able to process many millions or billions of transactions a second. So the good news is that there are, there are many approaches to solving this problem. Uh, so what I'm going to try and do in this talk is to describe some of those approaches, some of the upsides and downsides of each approach. Before we do all that, though, I want to take a step back. Right? Before we talk about scalability, I want to try and describe in uh, very simple terms so what cryptocurrencies are, how cryptocurrencies work. And then once we've gone through some of the basics, I want to try and say a little bit in a little bit more detail why some people at least are you know, excited about some applications of cryptocurrencies. Uh, and then we'll get on to the scalability issue. So I'll explain why scalability, scalability is a problem in the first place, like why it is that Bitcoin has no transaction rates in the first place. And then finally, we'll, we'll discuss some solutions. OK, so first of all, then, let's take that step back. And let's see how the Bitcoin protocol works. OK. In order to describe the protocol, though, uh, we do need a couple of very basic ideas from cryptography. OK, so I promise it's not going to be a technical talk. But in order to get anywhere, we do need just a couple of very basic ideas. OK. And the first basic idea we need from cryptography is hash functions. Okay, hash functions are very simple things, uh, at least in terms of the service they provide, right? at least in terms of what we need to know about them right now. They're functions, right, which means they take inputs and they give outputs. And the form of input that a hash function takes is just any piece of data. Okay, so here you can think of data always as being represented by sequences of ones and zeros, so by binary strings. So what a hash function does is it takes any binary string as input, right, and then it gives a binary string of a fixed length as output. Normally, we work with hash functions which give outputs which are 256 symbols long. Okay, so what a hash function does then is it takes any binary string of any length as input and it gives you a 256 bit string as output. Okay, and then it has one other important property. So, whenever you feed in the same input, you have to get the same output. But other than that, a hash function acts essentially like a random string generator. Okay, so I feed in the same input several times and I'm going to get the same output each time. But if I then go back and I change the input by even like a single bit, maybe I change a 1 to a 0 or something like that, then this hash function will act essentially like a random string generator and will very probably produce something entirely different looking. Okay? So basically hash functions are you know, just random string generators. I say they act essentially like a random string generator because if we want these things to be calculated by computers, and we do want them to be efficiently calculated by computers, then they can't actually, in a strict sense, really be random. But the important point is that, to all intents and purposes, they look random as far as we're concerned right now. Okay? So that's hash functions. They're basically just random string generators which always give uh, outputs of the same length. An immediate consequence of that is that you're unlikely ever to find two inputs which hash to the same value. And the reason there is very simple. It's basically just because the number of possible outputs there is enormous. Okay, the number of possible outputs is the number of 256-bit strings, that's 2 to 256, which is more than there are atoms in the universe. Okay? So we feed in two different inputs, and if this function is acting essentially like a random string generator, then the probability of these two different inputs happen to be mapped to exactly the same thing, that's astronomically small. Okay. So that's our first basic tool, that's hash functions. They're essentially just random string generators, always give outputs at the same length. Thing. Okay? And then our second basic tool is digital signatures. And again, the functionality provided by digital signatures is extremely simple. Okay? The, the cryptography behind them might be clever, but we, don't, you know, we can black box all of that. Right? All we care about is the way in which they're used. And the way in which digital signatures are used is, is as follows. So let's suppose that one person wants to send a message to, to somebody else. OK, 
Okay, let's suppose that Alice is the one who wants to send the message. And she wants to send a message to Bob. So again, the message is just a piece of data, so you can think of it as being a binary string here. Okay. So in that context, cryptography provides us with a clever process that Alice can go through, whereby she takes this message, right, and she uses that to produce a special extra piece of data, which is specific to the message, and she call her signature for the message. Okay, and the way in which this works is that she then sends the message together with the signature to Bob, then through the magic of cryptography, Bob can be sure that the message came from Alice. Okay, so if Alice wants to send message, a message to Bob, she goes through this special process which produces uh, this extra special piece of data which we call the signature for the message, which is specific to the message. Right? So I'm picturing the, the signature as this small box hanging off the side of the message there. Right? And the way in which this works is she sends the message together with the signature to Bob, then Bob can be sure the message came from Alice. Okay? Now, it's clear, if this is to work, then the signature has to be specific to the message, right? Because if not, if different messages have the same signature, well, then Eve, who's listening in, she could take a different message, and she could append a signature from one of Alice's old messages to this new message, right? Make it look like this new message is from Alice. So clearly, that won't work, right? That's not the way we, we want things to work. So clearly, the signature will have to be specific to the message. It's also clear, if this is to work, then Bob has to be able to recognize that the signature is correct once he sees it, right? But it can't be the case that Bob could produce the signature in the first place, otherwise he's going to be able to forge messages as if they're from Alice. Okay, so the way I've pictured things here, the signature is just, is just a, a few bits long in the picture, but it would actually be a few hundred bits long, okay? So it might be somewhat surprising this to be done, but it can be done. Um, <clears throat> As I say, the functionality achieved is very simple. All we have to care about is the functionality. The functionality achieved is very simple. Basically, what this ensures is that when someone sends a message, the receiver can be sure who it came from. Okay, that's all there is to it. Okay, so those are our two basic tools. So we have hash functions. They just random string generators, simple as that. Then we have digital signatures, and the functionality they provide is just this, that people can be sure who messages come from. Okay, so now we have these two basic tools, let's think about how we would design a cryptocurrency, okay? Well, the whole point of Bitcoin is that we want it to be decentralized, okay? So ultimately, we want to define a protocol which works without the use of a central bank. Okay, and the motivation there is that centralized control or too much centralized control can be a bad thing, those in control can be corrupted or otherwise compromised, and that decentralized systems can be more robust, okay? So ultimately, we want to define a protocol which works without the use of a central bank. But just to keep things simple, let's start off by imagining how things will work with the use of a central bank. Okay, so we're gonna start off simple with the central bank, and then we'll think about how to remove the use of the central bank later on, okay? It's presumably also the case that our currency is gonna be divided up into multiple units of currency, so the equivalent of many pounds or many dollars or whatever, right? But again, just to keep things super simple, let's start off by concentrating on what happens to a single unit of currency, a coin, let's say, Okay, and let's imagine that coin is indivisible. So in that situation, we might run things as follows. Okay, so we might, we might insist that every user of the currency keeps a ledger for this coin. And that ledger might look something like this. It might say, this is coin number one. First of all, the coin was owned by John. And next, the coin was owned by Alice. Okay, so this version of the ledger records the fact that the coin is presently owned by Alice. It also recalls the fact that John was the first owner of the coin. Let's not immediately worry about how John came to own the coin in the first place. That's a slightly separate issue. Okay, but this version of the ledger recalls the fact that Alice is the present owner. If Alice now wants to spend her coin, what could she do? Well, she could form a new version of the ledger, right, recording the fact that the coin is now owned by Frank. So let's suppose, let's suppose she wants to give Frank this coin in return for some chickens, something like that, right? She could form a new version of the ledger, Given the, the, which records the fact that the coin is now owned by Frank, she could send that new version of the ledger to the central bank, right, who would then distribute the new version of the ledger to all other users. In order that only Alice can spend her coin, though, she better add her digital signature to this new version of the ledger. Right? We better require that her digital signature is there, right, so that only she can spend the coin. Yeah? So I'm picturing that as this little square block, block at the end of the, end of the new version of the ledger, yeah? So this little black box here is Alice's signature for the new version of the ledger, giving the coin to Frank. 
And if Alice had to sign that version of the ledger when she gave her coin to Frank, then of course John would have had to sign the previous version of the ledger when he gave the coin to Alice, right? Okay. So when Alice wants to spend her coin, she forms a new version of the ledger, giving the coin to Frank. She then forwards this new version, this signed version of the ledger to the central bank. They then check that everything's in order, that the, the signature's correct and so on. And then the central bank can forward this new version of the ledger to all users. When Frank sees that new version of the ledger has been distributed, he's then happy to give Alice her tickets. Okay? So this basically works, right? What do we achieve with this? Well, first of all, it's clear that only Alice can spend her coin because only Alice can add the necessary digital signature which is required in order for her to spend her coin. Yeah? So only Alice can spend her coin because only she can add the required digital signature. It's also clear that she can't spend the coin twice, right? Because if she, if she forwards one version of the ledger, giving the coin to Frank, and she forwards that to the central bank, and then later on she forms a new version of the ledger, giving the coin to Derek, and she forwards that to the central bank, well, then the central bank will object, right? Okay, so this gives us a, a rudimentary functioning currency. So now, though, let's think what happens without the use of the central bank. Okay, let's run things fairly similarly. Let's suppose that if Alice wants to spend her coin, now she forms a new version of the ledger giving the coin to Frank. She signs that new version of the ledger. Now, though, she can't give that new version of the ledger to the central bank because there is no central bank now. So what she does is she, she starts distributing the new version of the ledger directly to other users of the currency. Okay, those other users of the currency, they have to check that this transaction is, you know, is correct, that everything's in order, that the signature is correct, and so on. And then once they've done that, we can imagine that they'll then distribute on to other users of the currency who will in turn check that the signature is correct and so on before carry on distributing it and so on, right? Okay. okay, so now what happens then? Well, it's still the case in this situation where right, only Alice can spend her coin. Because only Alice can add her the necessary signature that's required in order to spend her coin, right? Okay? So that part still works. The problem now is that she might be able to spend the coin twice. Right? What Alice could now do, she could form one version of the ledger giving the coin to Frank, she could form another version of the ledger giving the coin to Derek, and then the question is how are we to know which version of the ledger is correct? Yeah. And there are all sorts of little tricks you might try to get around that. You might say, well, maybe people should believe the version of the ledger they see first, but then what, what Alice could do, she could form one version of the ledger giving the coin to Frank, show some people that version first, Form another version of the ledger giving the coin to Derek and show other people that version first. Or you might say, well, if Alice is signing these contradictory versions of the ledger, then she's clearly dodgy, so what we should do is just invalidate both of those transactions, and maybe we'll just cancel Alice's coin to punish her or something like that. Right? The problem then is that Alice might form a new version of the ledger giving the coin to Frank. So far, she's done nothing wrong, right? So Frank is happy about it, he gives her the chickens. And then once she's got the chicken, she can now form another contradictory version of the ledger, giving the coin to someone else, which will then cancel the transaction which gives Frank the coin. Okay, she'll be taking Frank's coin away, so that doesn't work either. Okay, and basically there's no really simple uh, fix that will work. So what can we do in order to, to avoid double spending? Well, let's take this in stages, okay? So, <clears throat> first of all, we were working according to the assumption that we were concentrating a single coin. That was just for the sake of simplicity. So let's now drop that assumption. Let's have a universal ledger, which works essentially the same way, but it just records what happens to all coins. Okay, so now all users of the currency keep a universal ledger, which records what happens to all coins. Okay, and all users of the currency are responsible for, for, for verifying that that ledger is correct. So that ledger might look something like this. Um, let's also imagine, and I should say, okay, Initially, the way I'm setting things up here is slightly different than Bitcoin. We're going to start off a little bit different than Bitcoin, but we'll make it like Bitcoin later on. Okay? Let's also imagine the way this, this ledger works is that each transaction here specifies its predecessor in some way. Okay, so the third transaction here, somewhere within the data of the third transaction, it specifies that the second transaction here is the predecessor. Okay? So what that means is that if this is a valid version of the ledger, <coughs> then I can't form another valid version of the ledger by, say, just removing the second transaction and having the third one point to the first or something like that, right? Because it's hidden within the data of the third transaction who its predecessor is. Okay, so this is basically, the first step is just that we're going to keep a universal ledger for all coins, 
And okay, we're also we're running the ledger in such a way that you can't tamper with your order of transactions in the, in the, in the, in the ledger. Yeah? Okay. okay, and then what we could do, and again, this is not exactly how Bitcoin works yet, but we'll make it like Bitcoin. What we could do is we'll, we could specify what we'll call a proof of work for each transaction. Okay, and what that proof of work is, is just the result, the outcome of some hard computational task, okay, which is specific to that transaction. So for each transaction, we have to specify some hard computational task, which is specific to the transaction. So that's some task which will take the average computer a long time to carry out. Okay, and then the proof of work is just the outcome of that, that, that hard computational task. Okay? And then we agree that, you, okay, you can only append transactions to the ledger once the corresponding proof of work for the given transaction has been completed. So that initially sounds a little bit mysterious, don't worry, I'll specify in a little bit exactly how the proof of work should be defined. Okay? Okay, so we specify a proof of work that has to be completed before transactions can be added to the ledger. And now what happens is that when Alice wants to spend her coin, right, she sends the transaction out into the network of users as a whole, and everybody starts working to try and find this corresponding proof of work. Once someone finds the proof of work, then the transaction can be embedded into the ledger. Okay, and the way I'm depicting things here is that once the corresponding proof of work has been found, the transaction turns red. Okay, so once the transaction is red, it can actually be added to the ledger. And the way in which we set things up here, <clears throat> okay, we make sure that finding the proofs of work is sufficiently difficult, that it's the rate at which the network as a whole can find these proofs of work, which determines how quickly the ledger grows. Okay, so if the network as a whole can find, on average, let's say, three proofs of work per minute, then the ledger will, on average, grow by three transactions per minute. Okay, so so far, so good. Uh, <coughs> We don't seem to have achieved that much, though. All we've, all, we've, all we've done, really done so far, is we've made sure that it's harder to add transactions to the ledger. Right now, we can't add a transaction unless some proof of work is attached. Okay, but now we make two further specifications, and then we'll be done. Okay, so the two specifications we make are as follows. So first of all, we specify that the correct version of the ledger is always the longest one. So that's the one with the most proof of work attached, if you like. Okay, so if any user sees two different versions of the ledger. The one they'll regard as correct is just the longest one. Okay, so that's the first specification we make. And then we also specify that the transaction is considered confirmed once it's in the ledger with the appropriate proof of work, and once it's followed by sufficiently many transactions. And what sufficiently many means there will depend upon the level of security you want. So more security means be followed by more transactions. Okay, and that's it. Okay, so we just Specify those two things. So the correct version of the ledger is always the longest one. Okay, you're confirmed once you're in the ledger and you're followed by sufficiently many transactions. So certainly that sounds very simple, right? But why would this work? So how would this avoid double spending? Well, let's imagine that I'm Frank, right? And Alice is transferring this coin to me in return for these chickens. And let's, let's suppose that the transaction I care about is this third transaction here, okay? And let's suppose that the present version of the ledger, the longest version of the ledger, looks like this. Okay. Well, if Alice wants to double spend, right, then she's going to have to form a new version of the ledger which doesn't include the transaction I care about. Right? But in order for anybody to believe that new version of the ledger, it's going to have to be the longest version of the ledger. So what Alice is going to have to do, she's going to have to fork off before the point, before the transaction I care about, and she's going to have to start trying to form a new, longer version of the ledger, which branches off in this new direction. For each transaction she adds in, though, she has to find the corresponding proof of work. Right? She can't use these transactions which appear later on in the ledger, because they specify their predecessors. And if she starts trying to tamper with that data, the proof of work won't be right, and so on. Okay? So for each, each transaction she adds in, she really does have to find the corresponding proof of work. The problem for Alice is that while she does that, the rest of the network combined is working to extend the longest version of the, of the ledger, right? So ultimately, in order for Alice to catch up, in order for her to produce the longest chain, she's going to have to be producing these proofs of work faster than the rest of the network combined. Right? Ultimately, in order for her to double spend, she's going to need more computational power than the rest of the network combined. In case that's the basic idea here, that a malicious user won't be able to double spend unless they have more computational power than the rest of the network combined. As long as that's not the case, then
then what we've established is a, a secure and tamper-proof ledger which operates in an entirely decentralized way. Okay. Some details to tie up there. So first of all, let's call the people who are looking for the necessary proof of work miners. Right? You've probably heard of Bitcoin miners. Well, it turns out that the task of providing all this proof of work is, is expensive. Right? You've got a, there's hardware required, there are electricity costs, and so on. So we have to pay, pay these people for their effort. How can we do that? Well, we're defining a currency here, so it's quite easy. We just give them some units of currency, right? So whenever, whenever a miner produces an appropriate proof of work, we'll give them some units of currency for their effort. Okay, so that's what Bitcoin mining is, and that's why people Bitcoin mine. A second detail here is, that, so so far, I've considered a version of the ledger in which we append transactions individually. Okay, it turns out if we work that way, uh, we'll end up with all sorts of timing issues. Basically. The basic problem is that the underlying communication network has some latency, right? So it takes time for messages to travel across the underlying communication network. If we look at things at the level of individual transactions, then you might have 10 transactions produced per second. So very often you'll have two transactions being produced almost simultaneously. And what that will mean is that some people will see one transaction first, while other people see another, the other transaction first. Okay? And the result of that will be basically that it's hard for us to decide which of those two transactions should go, should go first into the ledger. Ultimately, if we work at the level of individual transactions, what we'll end up with is a big jumbled mess here. Okay? So it turns out to be much neater, much tidier, to have the miners group transactions together into large blocks of transactions, maybe a couple of thousand transactions in each block. Okay? And then rather than requiring a proof of work for each transaction, now we just require a proof of work for each block. Okay, so that's the way that Bitcoin works. We have, uh, on average, we have a, a, a new block of transactions produced once every 10 minutes or so. And then this, this sequence of blocks of transactions, that's, that's referred to as the blockchain. Right? Okay, and then one final detail. Uh, so I said I'd specify precisely how the proof of work should be defined. So we can do this very easily using an agreed on hash function. Uh, so from what I just said, we don't, need a, we don't actually need a proof of work for each transaction. Now we just need one for each block. Right? So what we do is the following. We take the data for the block, or maybe some of the data for the block, and then we agree that a proof of work for the block is just what we call a nonce for the block. Okay, and a nonce is defined very simply as follows. For, so for any given k by a nonce, or maybe a k nonce for the block, it means something we can append to the block, so a binary string we can append, so that when the block and this extra appendix, the extra binary string, the nonce are fed into the, the hash function together as one long string, then what we get is an output which ends with at least k many zeros. Okay. So if you think about that, uh, so if k is 1 here, then on average we're going to have to try two nonces before we find one that works. Right, if k is 2, then on average we'd have to try four nonces before we find the one that works. Right, this is growing in powers of 2. So if we make k large, then this becomes a hard computational task. And basically by playing with k, we can make the task of finding a nonce, we can make the task of finding a proof of work exactly as hard as we want it to be. Okay, so that's basically how Bitcoin works. So now let's uh, just think a little bit about some of the pros and cons. So here I've listed more cons than pros, that's not to be negative, maybe the pros are more important than the cons, right? Um, so certainly one of the real strengths of Bitcoin is the fact that this is a, you know, really is a very simple and elegant protocol. The fact that it's a simple protocol is, is more than just a nicety, right? Basically, the simpler a protocol is, the less ways there are for an adversary to, to attack it. Okay, so the fact that it's a simple protocol really is a strength. Bitcoin's been around for uh, over 10 years or so now, and you know, people have developed, they've pointed out various different weaknesses in the protocol. There are, some, there are certainly situations in which Miners may be incentivized to deviate from the protocol, that sort of thing. But so far, it seems overall to be a, perhaps surprisingly robust, right? perhaps surprisingly stable protocol. It's certainly been road tested to a certain extent by now. There are, though, uh, quite a few issues. So first of all, there's this fact that we have low transaction rates. That's what we're going to talk about in more detail. Right? Uh, it's also the case that this task of uh, providing all the proof of work is extremely energy inefficient. So Bitcoin mining presently uses more electricity than many small countries. Right? So this is, this is also a, a very serious issue. It's also the case, and this is perhaps something that should be better understood than it is, 
But although Bitcoin sounds very secure when I say that in order for a malicious user to double spend, they'll require more computational power than the rest of the network combined. Right, although it might sound like that's very unlikely, it might sound very unlikely that any single user is going to have more computational power than the rest of the network combined, actually the situation changes a bit when you do a more detailed analysis and when you start thinking about the adversary in terms of how much they have to spend rather than their computational power. So the essential point here is just this. So ultimately, the amount of mining you get is only what you pay for. Right? The rest of the... the this network of users might have large amounts of mining power, but they're not going to use it unless you're paying them for it. Ultimately, the amount of mining you get is only what you pay for. And over a period of a year or so, long term, the amount of money you can pay to miners will only be a small fraction of the total value of the currency. Right? Year in, year out, you can't realistically pay miners, say, 50% of the total value of the currency. Otherwise, very quickly, the miners would own everything. Right? So working on a, on a long-term basis, year in, year out, over a period of a year or so, the total amount of money you pay to miners for mining will only be a small fraction of the, of the total value of the currency. And what that means is that actually, in order for a malicious user to, to, to repeatedly double spend, potentially bring the currency down, all they really need to do is outspend that small fraction of the total value of the currency on mining during that given time period. Okay? So actually, you can do a calculation. Right? You can very accurately go out and measure right now what is the total mining power of the Bitcoin network combined. Right? That's very accurate. You can, you can measure that very accurately. And then you can look to see, okay, how much money would it cost me to buy that much hash power? How much money would it cost me so that I have more mining power than the rest of the network, the Bitcoin network combined? Turns out right now you need about, about $3 billion to do that. Okay? The total value of Bitcoin right now is about $70 billion. So right now, something like a sort of 5% kamikaze attack is possible. Okay? So that's an analysis in which I'm being fairly generous because I'm, I'm requiring you to actually buy the hardware. Actually, things become worse if you, could, if you can hire hardware for a month or two at a reasonable rate. Okay? So you may or may not think that's a serious problem. Uh, maybe it isn't a serious problem right now because probably no one wants to spend $3 billion right now bringing down Bitcoin. But if this was to become a, like a really large part of your economy, then I'd argue it is a serious problem. Right? Ultimately, it's not a tenable situation that someone can spend a small amount of money to bring down a large part of your economy. And then there are other issues that we don't have time to talk about right now. Um, <clears throat> I think it is worth pointing out right now that the proof-of-stake currencies are a possible solution to many of these problems. Uh, so just very briefly and very roughly, how do they work? So with the proof-of-work currency, as we've been talking about so far, the way things work is that for any given miner at any given point in time, the probability that that miner will be producing the next block is proportional to their mining power. Okay, you have twice the mining power, you're twice as likely to be the next person who finds the next proof of work, you're twice as likely to be the person who produces the next block. With a proof of stake currency, we set things up in such a way that at any, any point in time and for any user, the probability you'll be the one producing the next block is proportional to your wealth. Okay, so it's a different type of protocol. The disadvantage of proof-of-stake proof of currencies is that technically they're more difficult to set up. Those technical difficulties, though, are not insurmountable. And then the advantages are that they're energy efficient, they're not subject to these, this 5% kamikaze attack that I've talked about there, and they're also probably more amenable to uh, various uh, scalability solutions such as sharding that we'll talk about later on. Okay, so the point I'm making there is just that proof-of-stake currencies are an interesting possibility for the future. Okay, so now we're almost ready to talk about scalability in detail. Just before we do that, though, I want to talk a little bit about some possible applications of cryptocurrencies, which may not be entirely obvious. And in particular, I want to talk just briefly about smart contracts. Uh, the reason being that the motivation for finding a really strong solution to the scalability problem is in part provided by interesting uses for smart contracts. Okay, so so far... We've only considered transactions of the simplest type. We've considered transactions in which person A pays, pers pays person B. So maybe Alice pays X units of currency to Bob, right? So technically, the way that works is that Alice sends out a transaction which specifies that those units of currency no longer belong to her, and they can now be claimed by anybody providing Bob's signature. Okay, so you might think of this, you might call this a one-signature transaction, at least in the sense that now one signature is required to release the funds, just Bob's signature. Yeah. 
In Bitcoin, though, uh, more Bitcoin does allow for more complex type of transactions. So, for example, you could also allow that, say, any three or five specific name signatures are required to release the funds. Okay, and there are situations in which that might be useful functionality. So, in this sort of situation where transactions can work more than one way, how should Alice specify how she wants her transaction to work, right? Whether she wants one signature to release the funds or three or whatever. Well, a natural thing to do is that we should develop a simple language which Alice can use to express how she wants her transaction to work. Okay, and this is what happens with Bitcoin. So in Bitcoin, we have a simple sort of scripting language right, which Alice can use to specify how the transaction should work. And with Bitcoin, this language is fairly simple. This, though, is just the, the beginning of what's possible. So with Ethereum, which is the second largest cryptocurrency by, by value, this is rather different in the sense that it has a Turing complete scripting language. Okay, so what this means is that the language that you now use in order to specify how transactions should work, this language is sufficiently powerful that it can simulate any other programming language. Okay, so now, in fact, a transaction can implement anything that can, can be programmed. Okay, so, so this would seem to open up a, a whole new world of possibilities. Uh, the way in which this is implemented in Ethereum, uh, so the language is used is as follows. So don't worry, this seems a little bit vague. This is just to give you a sort of gist of the way in which things work. So in Ethereum, so users can create what are called contracts. So contracts are just a uh, piece of code written in this Turing complete scripting language. Contracts live on the blockchain, i.e. they're recorded on the blockchain. Okay? Contracts have memory. Users can send money to contracts and can pay to execute contracts and so on. So the interesting question then becomes what, what, what useful things might you want to do with such smart, smart contracts? Okay? And to a, certain, to a certain extent, that's still an open question. And certainly the, the existence of this Turing complete scripting language would seem to open up a new interesting world of possibilities, but many of those possibilities require very strong solutions to the scalability problem. Okay, so maybe it's useful to, to see a couple of examples. So one example that's talked about is that you might want to use smart contracts in order to implement decentralized versions of social media applications like Facebook. Okay? And the motivation there would be that if, you, if you're running a decentralized application, which isn't controlled by any given any single user, then the way in which personal data is handled becomes entirely transparent. Okay, so that doesn't mean that your personal data becomes public, it just means that the way in which personal data is handled becomes entirely transparent. Okay. So that, though, is a very ambitious application that would require a very strong solution to the scalability problem, not just in terms of transaction rates, but also in terms of decentralized methods of storing data. Uh, then there are all sorts of other interesting possibilities which arise if, and it's a big if, if you're able to get really interesting and useful information about the outside world into the blockchain in a reliable fashion. So if, so if you're able to get pricing information, for example, so information about the prices of which stocks and commodities are trading, if you can get that information into the blockchain in a reliable fashion, then it becomes a simple task to write smart contracts which can simulate futures, call options, put options, any kind of, any kind of exotic derivative you want to. So that, again, would seem to open up a whole new world of possibilities. Um, <clears throat> so that, that problem, the problem of getting uh, reliable information about the outside world recorded into the blockchain in a reliable fashion, that's often referred to as the Oracle problem. OK, so now then, let's take a look at the scalability problem. And in fact, so the entire structure of everything I'm going to say is depicted on this slide here. So on the left-hand side, we have the problem. And what's, what's depicted there is the fact that we have two fundamental scalability bottlenecks. Okay? And I'll talk about those in detail in a little bit. And on the right-hand side, we, this refers to the solutions. And what's detailed there is the fact that we have, of all the different solutions, they can all be categorized as belonging to three different layers. Okay, so layer zero solutions are those which uh, suggest improvements to the underlying infrastructure used by the protocol, or maybe more efficient ways of using that infrastructure. Okay, so that might, imp that might include things like improving internet connectivity, that sort of thing. Then layer one approaches are those which involve changes to the protocol itself. And then layer two approaches, these are protocols which are implemented on top of the underlying cryptocurrency. So very briefly, the basic idea there is that we might be able to sort of farm most transactions out so they happen off-chain, and hopefully we can do that in such a way that there's no loss of security. Okay, so that sounds a little bit vague, and okay, it won't do in 10 minutes or so. 
okay, so before we talk about the solutions in detail, though, let's, let's understand the problem in detail. And let, first of all, let's try to understand exactly what these two bottlenecks are and where they come from. And let's start off by thinking about the first scaling bottleneck. Okay. So the first scaling bottleneck arises from what's normally called network latency. So this is basically just the fact that it takes time for information to travel across the underlying communication network. Okay, and what that means is that when a miner finds a new block, let's suppose that the red node here is a miner, and he's found a new block of transactions, right? He's found the proof of work for a new block, right? When the miner finds a new block, well, then it takes time for this new block to propagate out across the network. The sort of picture you can have in mind, the sort of figure you can have in mind, is that it might take 10 seconds, let's say, for that new block to, to reach the majority of the network. Now, with Bitcoin, blocks are produced on average once every 10 minutes. So it doesn't happen very, very frequently that blocks are produced almost simultaneously, but it does happen with some regularity. And what happens then, when, when two blocks are produced almost simultaneously, is that it splits the network. Okay, so here, let's imagine that the red block, red node here, is a miner who's found one new block. Okay, the, the yellow node here is a miner who's found another block almost simultaneously. What will then happen is that these two blocks will propagate out across the network, but some users will see one block first, other users will see another block first. Yeah? And the way in which the Bitcoin protocol works is that so people, okay, users will prefer, they'll always believe the longest chain, but in the case of a tie, they'll go with the version they see first. Okay, so this really, uh, splits the network here, right? So now what happens is we have half of the network roughly looking to extend the longest chain above the red block, and the other half of the network are looking to extend the longest chain above the yellow block, okay? So now we have only half the network looking to find proof of work above either side of this fork. So briefly then, so long as this fork is here, basically that's making it twice as easy for our adversary, right? Okay, so now with Bitcoin, this happens fairly infrequently, right, because blocks are only produced once every 10 minutes or so on average, right, so it's fairly infrequently the case that they're going to be produced right next to each other. But if you produce blocks twice as fast, then it would happen twice as much. Right? Or if we make our blocks twice as large, so they've got twice as many transactions in, then they'll take twice as long to propagate through the network. Again, it'll happen roughly twice as much. If we go the whole hog, and let's say we produce a block every five seconds or so, remembering it takes 10 seconds for, for blocks to propagate through the network, well, then we're going to get forks within forks within forks, okay, and basically chaos will ensue. Okay, so that's the first scaling bottleneck. Basically, the point is that network latency means that blocks cannot be produced too quickly without sacrificing security. Okay, so that's the first scaling bottleneck, and then... The second scaling bottleneck is perhaps more basic. <clears throat> the basic point here is that so long as we have all users verifying all transactions, well, then we can only process transactions as fast as the processor of our weakest user. Okay, so to bring the point home there, let's imagine we want to implement a decentralized web 3.0. Then it's not even beginning to be a feasible task that my computer should have to deal with all of my own interactions with the web not just that, but also your, all of your interactions with the web, and in fact that my computer would have to deal with all interactions of all users, right? That would be a ridiculously inefficient way to run things. And if that was the only way to run things, then you'd certainly prefer a decentralized, computationally efficient solution over decentralization. Yeah. Okay, so scaling solutions dealing with this bottleneck aim to reduce the verification tasks of individual users without sacrificing too much security. Basically, you have to partition things up, right? You want some users verifying some, some transactions, while other users verifying some of the other transactions. Okay. Okay, so those are the two fundamental scaling bottlenecks. Hopefully, the, the difference between them is clear. They're both important. Uh, if you have a really strong solution to the first scaling bottleneck, the latency bottleneck, then you might be able to get somewhere like visa-like transaction rates. But if you want to do anything really interesting, you're going to need to see a solution to the second scaling bottleneck. If you have a really strong solution to the se second scaling bottleneck, then you may or may not need a solution to the first scaling bottleneck. It depends on how strong a, solu a, a solution to the scalability problem you want. Okay, so those are the problems. So now let's <clears throat> just briefly start looking at some of the solutions. Um, we don't have that much time, though, so I'll, I think I'll skip straight over layer zero solutions and start talking immediately about layer one solutions. 
So we call layer one solutions are those which involve changes to the, to the protocol itself. Okay, so now we're taking the Bitcoin protocol and we're changing it, we're, we're replacing it with something which might be more efficient in certain ways. And then amongst the layer one solutions, we can differentiate between those which are approaches to solving the, the first scaling bottleneck, like the latency bottleneck, and those which are approaches to solving the second uh, scaling bottleneck. Amongst those which are approaches to the first scaling bottleneck, uh, a particularly simple one is the Ghost Protocol, which is also the name of a Mission Impossible film, which I think we've done on purpose. I think. Um, so this is very simple, so maybe we'll, we'll start off by, by looking at that one. Okay, so this is, a, this is a layer one approach to solving the first scaling bottleneck, the latency bottleneck, okay? So let's recall what the problem is. Uh, so the basic problem is that when you have forks, this splits the network, it makes it easier for a reversal to double spend. Okay, so if, if I was waiting for confirmation in this block here, and the yellow blocks here are produced by some adversary, well then he's, able to, he's been able to produce the longest chain, even though he's produced less blocks, basically because of the existence of this fork here. Okay, so the existence of forks makes it easier for the, the adversary to double spend. That's the basic point. And what the ghost protocol says is very simple. It says, well, okay, in that case, let's forget about using the longest chain. Okay, let's no longer consider the longest chain to be correct. Instead, we'll choose between two prongs of a fork, we'll choose between two different ways to proceed by choosing that block which has the most descendants. Okay, so that block which is followed by the most blocks. Okay. So that, according to that rule, if we're trying to choose here between the red circle block and the yellow circle block, well, now we're going to choose this red circle block because he has eight descendants, while this yellow circle block only has five. Okay, so now you can see okay, what that's achieved is that this fork here is no longer important, right? Even though there's a fork, all these follow nodes, they're still descendants, so the fork doesn't matter. Okay, so this sounds like a very simple solution, and it is. It is though, it's also only a partial solution, okay? And the reason for that is maybe a little bit more subtle. <clears throat> so what the ghost protocol ensures is that once all honest nodes are extending the chain above the block we care about, right, once you've got to that point, okay, then the protocol ensures that honest forks don't matter, right? Then it doesn't matter that we've got this fork because they're all descendants. What it doesn't say anything about, though, is how long you have to wait until you get to this point. How long do you have to wait till you get to the point where all on this node are extending the chain above the point we care about? So what could happen is the following sort of situation. I could be waiting for confirmation on this circle red block here. And the circle red block could become involved in uh, what you might call an honest tie. An honest tie in the sense that there are honest uh, users trying to extend both sides of this fork. Okay. And then, unfortunately, what happens, so in, in this sort of context, uh, the faster blocks are produced, in fact, the longer such ties can be expected to last. Okay, so the ghost protocol doesn't give us permission just to print blocks as fast as we like, because if we do that, then ultimately, ties of this, this type will be extended longer, and in fact, confirmation times might be increased. Okay, so it's a, it's a solution of sorts, but it's only a partial solution. Okay, so that's a layer one solution to the first scaling bottleneck, and there are others. Okay, so now let's see the layer one solution to the second scaling bottleneck, which is called sharding. Uh, so recall the basic problem here is that we don't want it to be the case that all users have to verify all transactions. And the basic idea behind sharding is extremely simple. So the response is, well, in that case, why don't we just run multiple blockchains? Okay, we'll run multiple blockchains and we require any individual user only to verify the transactions in, say, one of those blockchains. Okay, so that sounds like an extremely simple solution. A basic problem, though, is also fairly obvious. So if we go about this in a really obvious way, and let's suppose we're running a proof-of-work protocol, okay? Well, then, if we implement five different chains, let's say, then we'll have a fifth of the computational power concentrated in each of those chains, and it'll be five times easier for our malicious adversary to double spend on each individual chain. Okay, so we've got five times the transaction rate now. So we've got a fifth of the security. So that doesn't sound any use at all, right? With a proof of stake protocol, though, <coughs> this might not be such a problem. Okay, we don't have time to go into the technical details now. But basically, if you're running a proof of stake protocol, then it should be the case that you can run maybe hundreds or possibly thousands of chains simultaneously without any significant loss in security. Okay. There are lots of technical difficulties involved in doing that, though. Okay. Uh, so in particular, 
Uh, well, there are lots of things that become complicated, but in particular, transferring money, transferring money between chains can now make things complicated. Okay, so sharding is an interesting uh, approach, which is, which is complicated, which lots of people are presently working on. <clears throat> okay, so to finish off with then, let's, let's look at our <clears throat> layer two approaches, which are often thought of as being the most promising approach. So to recall layer two solutions, these are ones which involve building protocols which work on top of the underlying cryptocurrency. Okay, and the basic idea is that you want to farm, you might want to farm most transactions out so they happen off chain. And the idea is you want to have, you want to do that in such a way that there's no significant loss in security. Uh, so these are solutions to the, the second scaling bottleneck. And the common idea to all layer two solutions is basically this. So most transactions, in fact, can take place off chain, so without being recorded on chain. So long as the off chain interactions produce enough evidence for disputes to be resolved on chain if necessary. Okay, so again, if that sounds a little bit mysterious, then it'll sound less mysterious in about four minutes or so. Uh, so there are multiple examples we, we could look at here, but we don't have much time, so let's focus on the Lightning Network. Okay. So the way the Lightning Network works is we want to establish a, a network of what are called payment channels. And again, this is a protocol which we're building on top of the underlying um, cryptocurrency, right? which, which might be Bitcoin, for example. Okay, so for the Bitcoin, sorry, for the, for the Lightning Network, what, what we want to do is to establish a network of what we're going to call payment channels. Each payment channel is going to be between a pair of users. Okay, and the basic idea behind the payment channel is that it's going to allow most transactions between that pair of users to take place off-chain. And there are many different ways in which the details here could be, could be Im implemented, but one way is as follows. So let's suppose that Alice and Bob want to set up a payment channel. What they could do is they could send one transaction to the main chain. So this is a transaction which is going to the main chain. And this transaction might say something like, okay, so we're Alice and Bob. We want to set up this payment channel. And $10 of each of our assets should be frozen, should be put to one side until this payment channel is closed. So that's one transaction which they do send to the main chain. And once that's recorded inside the, the Bitcoin main chain, let's say, then the idea is that Alice and Bob are now free to trade back and forth off-chain without recording their, their interactions. And again, there are many ways in which the details here could work, but one way is as follows. So Alice, first of all, might buy something from Bob for a dollar, right? in which case they should both, both sign uh, something, let's call it an IOU, which says that Alice owes Bob a dollar. And they both sign this IOU. Then Bob might buy something from Alice for $4, let's say, which means that overall now Bob owes $3. So now again, they both sign an updated IOU, an IOU which records the fact that it's a later IOU, right, which now records the fact that Bob owes $3. Okay, then finally Alice might buy something from Bob for a dollar, okay, in which case they now sign this, again, updated IOU which records the fact that it's a later IOU and which now records the fact that Bob owes $2. And the idea is that they can carry on in this way so long as nobody ever owes more than the ten dollars they set aside, right? More than ten dollars that they froze. Okay. So now, at any given point, we can allow that either user can close out the channel, right? Simply by sending in the most recent IU to the main blockchain, right? And the idea is then that once that most recent IU arrives in the main blockchain, we'll set up it accordingly according to you know, the, the balance of that IU. We better be a, bit, a little bit careful, though, right? Because these interactions have been going back and forth between the two of them without everybody else seeing. So what Bob could try and do here is he could try and close out the channel by sending in this first transaction, which still says that Alice owes him a dollar. Okay, so when, we, when, we, when somebody tries to close out the channel, we better allow for what we'll call a dispute resolution period during which more recent IOUs can be, can be revealed. Yeah, and of course, the idea is that if this, dis dis if this dispute resolution process works properly, then basically it should be impossible to cheat. We can also make it expensive to cheat. We can find people for cheating. So if, if this is done properly, then basically we shouldn't really need to use it very often. Yeah. Okay, so that's the idea behind a single channel, which might not seem that exciting, but things become more useful once we consider a network of payment channels. Okay, so now what happens is if person A wants to pay person D, then they don't have to set up a new payment channel between the two of them, and that would involve putting interactions onto, onto the main blockchain. Instead, now person A can pay person D just via persons B and C, okay, without anything being recorded in the main blockchain. 
And we have to a little, be a little bit careful about the way this is implemented. We have to make sure there's no trust required. We have to make sure that money can't get stuck halfway along this chain and so on. Okay, but it can be done fairly simply. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind the way in which the Lightning Network works. Okay, so let's finish off with some, some brief conclusions then. Um, so I think it's fair to say it's only been a fairly short period of time since the scalability problem has been like a hot topic of debate. In that short period of time, there have you know, already been a large number of approaches developed. Some of those approaches have already been implemented, some are already sort of live and in, 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 the, in the testing phase. Uh, I think it's also fair to say you probably shouldn't regard any single approach as constituting an outright solution in and of itself, right? but that isn't really what's necessary here. Ultimately, what you want is an amalgam of approaches which combine to give the strongest solution possible. Right? So we already have versions of the Lightning Network which are live and in the testing phase. I think in the next few years we'll see implementations of sharding and also side chains and other things which I didn't have time to talk about today. So really, I guess you know, the, the proper question isn't really whether or not the, the scalability problem will be solved. The proper question is you know, to what extent will it be solved and how quickly? Right? And ultimately then, the question becomes, so for which applications will it be the case that we can solve the scalability problem to such an extent that in the battle between decentralization and computational efficiency, decentralization becomes an optimal solution? Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. Lots of things, lots of information in short time. I hope uh, you picked up something, you got a feeling what, what's happening, uh, why there is kind of technology involved, ideas involved. Uh, but yeah, I'd like to kind of open you in the audience to kind of pose any questions uh, related to Andy's talk, please, but a more general one. Okay, the gentleman. There's microphones going around, so please wait. And uh, kind of, yes. Uh, hi. So uh, one thing which I was wondering is, as the net as the network gets used more and more, and the blockchains get longer and longer, surely performance will degrade over time. Uh, is that not also another bottleneck that needs solving? So is the longer chains and the kind of uh, yeah the requirement to deal with long more and more information a bot going to be a bottleneck as well? Yeah, uh, so yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly an issue, right? So at the moment, I think the, the Bitcoin blockchain is something a few hundred gigabytes long, and so it's gradually becoming more and more of an issue as time goes on. Um, so yes, it's an issue. I think it, it, that's not a deep technical problem, though. So it's, it's, you know, it's something that if you want to solve, you can solve, in the sense that, okay, so what information do most users really need? If you go back a few hundred blocks, then basically the whole point of the way in which Bitcoin works is that things aren't going to change before that point anyway, right? So all you really need to store is what's called the unspent transaction outputs, which is a slightly technical term, sorry. But okay, all you really need, all most users need to store really is a few, a few hundred blocks and a small extra piece of data. So while what you're saying is true, it is something that needs to be solved, it is a growing problem as time goes on, it's not really something that's really gonna be like a, a fundamental thing that stops progress. I think it's, it's, a, it's a, essentially an easy, easy, easy technical problem, that one. Yeah. Easy technical problems. Where have we heard that before? <laughs> okay. Heard it. Can, please, can you wait for the microphone? So are there also economists trying to address the issue that a currency that has a fixed amount of um, coins that are around, I mean, they're uh, limited by design, are bad because they don't scale in the sense that uh, they become an object of speculation, uh, mass massively so, obviously, rather than of transaction. People try to hoard these things. Yeah. I mean, I mean, because that's what Adam Smith already said about uh, gold. It's a very bad way of having money because people hoard it and rather than spending it, and you have all these fluctuations, speculation, and so on. So do people try to address the issue of how you can decentralize, increase the money supply if you trade more goods? Yeah, I, I think the basic point there is, I mean, even beyond that, so none of these currencies, none of these currencies, currencies are even beginning to be designed to be the central currency around which an entire economy is run, right? So that's a, a certain issue with, with Bitcoin. Okay, so you have a maximum of 21 million Bitcoins. That would cause, you know, deflationary issues, this sort of thing. But beyond that, I mean, you know, uh, it's just generally true that none of these currencies are even beginning to be anywhere near being a currency around which an entire economy should be run. 
uh, if you look at like a serious economy, if you look at the pound, you look at the dollar, then you know governments have things they can tinker with, they can play with interest rates, they can they can apply quantitative easing, that sort of thing. There are ways you can you can respond to changing e economic environments with central decentralized crypto, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies like this. Those forms of control don't exist. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think we're nowhere near the point where the kind of thing you're you're, you're talking about is really the, the most serious issue. Question in there. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, why should we care about cryptocurrencies? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, I, I guess part of my answer there would be uh, maybe you shouldn't, but if you should, then you know one of the one of the potential functionalities may be through this this issue of smart contracts, right? So smart contracts at present are not particularly useful because we haven't solved the scalability problem. They're very expensive to use. But if we can solve the scalability problem to a, to a serious degree, right, if you can really get transaction rates of you know, maybe a million transactions a second, that, that sort of thing, then smart contracts might become a really interesting and new functionality. I mean, so in particular also, if you can solve, uh, so I talked briefly there about the Oracle problem, right, the problem of getting uh, useful information about the outside world into the blockchain in a reliable fashion. If you can solve the Oracle problem or various useful instances of the Oracle problem, then suddenly, like I said, and you, you know, then the task of simulating, say, futures, call options, put options, any kind of exotic derivative you like, it becomes a fairly simple task. Uh, so the sort of picture there is, you know, I could be sitting at home, I could design my own financial product and just decide to issue that to the blockchain and trade with anybody else who's interested in doing so, without any brokers being involved, without any lawyers being involved, and so on. Uh, so certainly via smart contracts, you know, there's all sorts of new functionalities that might well be developed here. But all of that requires uh, strong solutions to the scalability problem. So, so right now, you know, it's, it's speculation. There's, that one was first, so let's, let's go to the gentleman in the middle. The microphone is on your way. Sorry for the delay, thank you. Um, would you consider investing in Bitcoin? Yes, no, and why? <laughs> <laughs> hey, very direct question. Okay, so Bitcoin is uh, an interesting one <clears throat> because okay, I, I think the, 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 the difficult thing to predict here is always the human element, right? So you can, look, you can look at the protocol, you can say this protocol works, this protocol doesn't work. This protocol has problems, but they're solvable and so on. But the human element is, is very difficult to predict. So with Bitcoin, uh, okay, so there, there are various technical problems which are maybe not that serious now, which might become more serious as time goes on. So for example, uh, there is the issue that, okay, so mining rewards are decreasing every four years or so, okay? The way that any proof of, st any proof of work currency works is that the, the security of the protocol is guaranteed by the level of mining which is taking place. Okay, so twice the amount of mining taking place means twice the security. Half the amount of mining take, taking place means half the security. The amount of mining which takes place is only the, the amount of mining that you pay for, right? So with Bitcoin, in order to keep the number of coins fixed at 21 million coins, the way things work is that the mining rewards are decreasing, they're halving every four years, they're decreasing at an exponential rate, okay, which would be a problem because then no one would be mining pretty soon. But the idea then is that the, the, the mining awards have to be replaced by transaction fees, okay? Which sounds fine until you do the sums and you realize that actually in order for the level of security to remain where it is right now, transaction fees will actually ultimately need to be enormous. You'll need enormous transaction fees. Okay, so to, to some extent, that might be ameliorated by things like the Lightning Network. So if, if most transactions are taking place off-chain, then large transaction fees are maybe on-chain, on it'll maybe a smaller problem. Uh, but the existence of the Lightning Network doesn't fully solve the, the, the basic problem that your underlying network has very high transaction fees, especially if competitors don't, right? So that's, that's potentially an issue for the Bitcoin network. I don't know how serious an issue, issue that will be. It's hard to predict, okay? Then there are other issues. So once you move to the, uh, this model on which you're paying people using uh, transaction fees rather than mining rewards, there are various papers which show that the, the protocol then becomes unstable in certain ways. Okay? There are then situations in which miners are no longer incentivized to, to extend the longest chain, this sort of thing. Okay? So again, that may well be a serious problem. It's, it's quite difficult to say exactly how serious the problem is. Uh, 
Both of those problems are, are potentially fixable, but they require like, serious changes to the Bitcoin protocol. Okay, and I guess it's one of the, the difficulties for Bitcoin, maybe it's a sort of irony, that okay, so Bitcoin is all about the process of reaching decentralized mechanisms of reaching consensus. But then the very fact that the, the, the Bitcoin community is fairly decentralized means that outside the context of the protocol, it's quite hard for them to reach consensus, to make changes to the protocol, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so the, there are various sort of things which are Potential technical issues, which you know may be solvable, which, you know, and also it's fairly difficult to say exactly how serious they'll be as technical issues. I mean, for me though, there's also this issue of the the five percent kamikaze attack that I talked about in the in the, uh, in the talk there briefly. Uh, so in that analysis, I was I was fairly generous. I imagined that the this malicious attacker had to, had to actually buy the hardware in order to carry out the attack. If you're able to to rent the hardware, let's say for a month or so at a reasonable cost. Then you're talking about something like a one like percent kamikaze attack. Okay, so this is this is, and that's not a problem just for, for Bitcoin. That's something that's common to all proof of work protocols. Okay, so uh, my answer is that I can't predict the future because human beings are unpredictable, and I don't know what will happen. Uh, but long term, my faith would be probably in a proof of stake pro pro protocol uh, for various reasons, because basically because they give stronger security guarantees. Because that means the answer to the question of the... Would I invest in Bitcoin? Well, okay, I, I haven't invested in Bitcoin so far. <laughs> I think that tells you all. <laughs> I think that, that tells you all that you, you kind of need to know. Okay, there was the question. Pento, and then we'll go to the, the next one. Yeah. Back, my question was uh, how the incentive uh, would be once all Bitcoins are mined, but you oh, okay. answered so that, that by... Okay. <laughs> I think okay. question whether you would invest in Bitcoin, but I have maybe a different question... Um, I heard that there is some hardware developed spe specifically designed to carry out these simple calculations quite fast. Um, is this hardware useful for different, maybe more meaningful tasks? <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's, that's also part of the silliness. So, so the, the, the hardware, the, the, the ASICs, this, this hardware that miners buy, which is built specifically in order that it can, it can, it can hash as fast as possible, is just built specifically for that task and has no other, no other function. So it's just a... A large waste of, of energy, other, th other than the fact that it's providing security for this for this um, for the network. Yeah. We have a question there. That's good. Um, the question regarding, I think, blockchains in general in mm. the protocol layer. So, what made um, the proof of work consensus algorithm special when other distributed algorithms also existed beforehand? And also, what are your thoughts on um, asynchronous? Visiting fault tolerant protocols like Honey Badger, BFT, and Definity Network for the future as a solution to the scalability issue. Yeah, okay, well, I guess, okay, what, what made Bitcoin uh, special was the fact that it was the first one that really worked, right? Uh, in terms of Byzantine fault tolerant arguments, uh, they are being employed, you know, particularly, I guess, one that I like is Algorand. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with, with Algorand. Uh, Algorand is, is a proof-of-stake protocol, which implements a, 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 an algorithm of that type. Um, it has certain issues in that it's, it's not necessarily as fast as some of the other protocols out there. But, uh, okay, I myself have been working on, on, on solving that problem, and so I, 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 you know, I think some of those techniques are, are potentially useful in, in the future, yeah. Okay, I think we have the question then next, and that one. let's go to the middle, the white shirt. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, on Bitcoin BSV, um, the capacity is basically uh, 128 uh, megabyte blocks for like sustained 24 hours, which is basically like 850 transactions per second and uh, like around four to five times uh, the capacity of uh, PayPal. So I was just wondering why um, you don't think that increasing block size is uh, like a solution to scalability? Well, okay, so th the basic problem if you increase block size is that well, whether it's apparent or not that you are decreasing security, right? So, I mean, you, you might think that's a reasonable compromise. So with, with, bit with Bitcoin, maybe, you know, the 10-minute time interval is longer than is required. Okay, you might think it's a good idea to increase the block size by a factor of 10, but when you do that, you are getting a, a decrease in security. And so it's, it's, it's a matter of balance. Why do you think it's a decrease in security? Well, that, okay, that, that's the first scalability bottleneck. Basically, whenever, if you, if you increase your block size, okay, then what's going to happen is if you, if you double the block size, then you're going to get forks twice as often. 
while the fork is there, you're basically making it twice as easy for your adversary to double spend. So if you, if you, if you, okay, if you, if you go so far as to produce, let's say, a block every five seconds or so, then you know, you've, got, you've got forks within forks within forks and forks and so on. But even before that, okay, the, the more forks there are, uh, the less security you have. So uh, just one last uh, point is that, uh, so miners would be incentivized to choose the block size. So the, the higher the block size, uh, the less chance of other people to, other miners to, to accept it. So they would basically configure the block size themselves. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Like basically, and that's what's uh, happening. So you're suggesting already. a protocol in which you get to choose your own block size. Uh, that's how like Bitcoin BSV, like miners, uh, the block size is minor con configurable. It's not like a, a hard code within the software. Okay, okay, I guess the problem there is that the, the miners then are going to be incentivized to make their blocks as large as possible in order to have as, much, as many transaction fees as possible. So you're just going to see the, a, an immediate decrease in security. And that sounds like a, it sounds like a very bad idea, but I would need to spend more time thinking about it. But it, it doesn't sound like a very good idea. No? Yeah, I, uh, I advise you to look into Bitcoin. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Someone in the back. Right. Yep. Can you please switch on the mic? No. Uh, I can hear you. I will repeat it. Hello? Yes. Is that better? Um, so I would love to just hear your comments about um, the, the irony with uh, blockchain technology and the ethos around decentralization and the plethora of uh, investment attention in large organizations and, and small in private permissioned blockchains. Uh, for example, speaking in the you know financial space, things like Cor Corda, uh, R3, uh, Ripple, Stellar, is, is that the future and the solution to some of these scalability problems to unfortunately make them permissioned? Yeah, okay, so for the benefit of the, of the audience then, so we have to dif differentiate very clearly between permissioned and permissionless systems, okay? So everything I was talking about today, these are all permissionless systems, which means that anybody's allowed to participate. And once you're participating, you're allowed as many identities as you like, right? So in fact, in, in Bitcoin, you're actively encouraged to have many identities so as to provide some level of uh, privacy, right? So, so, so it's maybe less clear who's really behind each trade. So those are permissionless systems. Uh, alternatively, you can consider permission systems in which, okay, only certain people are allowed to participate. If you do that, then it basically completely changes the, the technical problem that you're solving, okay? So, uh, okay, the basic problem, I guess, becomes entirely different than what I'm, what I'm, what I'm talking about today. And uh, an immediate consequence of that is you can get much higher transaction rates. Uh, so yeah, a lot of the, the banks are interested in working with permission systems, uh, particularly in reference to sort of international bank transfer, that sort of thing. Uh, and so, yeah, if you're working with permission systems, then you won't really expecting, you won't be expecting these scalability problems to arise so much. It, it shouldn't be so much of an issue. Okay. I think the gentleman there was first, second, and third. You can go for him. Yes, please. Hello, thank Hello. you. So, is it possible to prove that an attack was successful? Because it wasn't clear to me. And if, um, and if so, like, are there any methods to um, have some component of insurance? Like, does there, is there any protocol that add like insurance elements? Like, if an attack happen then you know somehow we can we can prove that that happened and uh, uh, the participants have some sort of protection against this event because it seems to me that we're trying to protect at all cost you know this um, uh, the, the attack from happening in the first place but I wonder if we can release or if anybody work on releasing that assumption and adding some sort of insurance so you, okay, the first part of the question was, can you prove that the attack happened, right? Well, I suppose I can say, okay, you, you'll certainly see the attack happen. So if, you, if you know, you'll see one version of the blockchain and suddenly it'll be replaced by another. So you yourself will, you know, will know that someone has, has gone through a double spending process. Uh, 
In terms of uh, whether some insurance can be offered, I mean, um, <clears throat> I guess the only example of that is, okay, so if, if some small majority, well, if it doesn't have to be a minority, it could be a minority or a majority, if you decide, okay, we don't either like the way, we don't like what's happened here, you could fork off, you could form your own version of blockchain, ignore what's happened after you know, a certain period of time, and, and turn the clock back, if you like. I mean, that's certainly something you could do, and that's certainly something that has happened. Yeah, that, that's possible. Has happened in, in what's, I mean, so there have been cases. So there, were, there was a problem in, so in Ethereum, for example, there was uh, an instance in which there was a theft or something, I don't know how damage was, maybe 100, 100 uh, billion dollars was, was stolen in, in some way. And so uh, there, was a, there was a large debate, eventually it was agreed to sort of go back in history and uh, um, delete all of the, all of the, the, the blocks that included the, that, that theft. Yeah. The gentleman in the back first, and then we'll go. Well, I'm not sure if you just covered that, for what I'm about to ask, but um, I was just going to say, um, if, say, a double spend does happen, what happens to the Bitcoins that are involved in that? Do they just get deleted, or...? Well, that, that, that would just mean that they've been, they've been transferred to one person, and now they're transferred to a different person, right? That's what the double spend means, so... Uh, it just means you're changing who has the money, basically. The money doesn't disappear, it just means that it's reallocated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one, and then we go right there. Hey, um, thanks for uh, the presentation. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna be a bit provocative here. So ah. the, the way you describe it, it sounds like if I had $3 billion, I can go and destroy the network, right? Which is actually not true. As we said, we can, we can fork, we can do a lot of things, right? I mean, I may be, you know, better off to go and crash, uh, you know, on Coinbase and the price, right? So can you, um, so I've never heard of the 5% uh, kamikaze attack. I've mm -hmm. always heard about 51% attack, mm -hmm. which is obviously in itself not a big deal if you think about it, because at the size that Bitcoin is at today, at the hash rate, I mean, it's huge. And then, you know, if you want to do a 51% attack, then if you want to change something that happened six blocks away, so say an hour ago, it's kind of almost, I mean, it tends to be very, very difficult, right? So I'm not talking about changing things like, you know, a year ago, which is, I mean, it's kind of impossible. So if you can comment a bit on that, I never like heard this 5% and what's the difference between uh, 5 and so the, the, the uh, 51? So the five percent attack is is weirdly something that's not sort of under not not discussed in the Bitcoin forum, but it is understood in academic circles. I can I can sort of point you to a paper by Eric Budish, if you like, which goes into the details of that. Uh, as I said, the, the situation is really worse than what I described there. Five percent is if you have to buy the hardware. If you if you're able to rent the hardware, it's even worse. Um, as you say, I mean, in response to that, if someone wants to to do that, if someone wants to spend all this money on this hardware. And repeat and repeatedly double spend in order to try and bring the currency down. You could start forking, but then they, they could just carry on uh, their business regardless, right? Uh, forking wouldn't necessarily be a solution. Um, so I think, I think really that's a problem which is basically common to any imaginable proof of work uh, protocol, I'm going to say. With, with, with proof of stake, though, it's not a problem. Okay. There were several hands. Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on DAG currencies like Nano and IOTA? Uh, I don't know the details of IOTA very well, I'm afraid. I'm passing that question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the speaker is allowed to pass on questions. <laughs> are there more questions? Yeah, if you, if you, if So with that in mind, would you say that it's an issue that it becomes centralized to the degree of people with more wealth have more power? That is something which is often raised, and I think uh, it's something, something you, you have to think through, but it's, it's not really as much of a problem as people normally say that it is. Basically, okay, there are two issues here. So there, there, is, there is the fact that there's some variance in the rate at which you receive rewards. Okay, so if you're expecting a 4% return each year, the way that the minor rewards work, you might get 3.9, you might get 4.1, there's some luck involved, okay, so there's some variance. If you put the variance to the side, to one side for a second though, 
other than that, it basically stacks like interest rates, right? So if I, if I start off with 10 units of currency, you have five, and then if we then apply whatever rate of interest rates we like, okay, I still have twice the amount of currency you do. So you're not, you're not changing the way in which the, the, the cake is sliced, right? There's no centralization of, 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 uh, of control, of power. Uh, and then the, the issuance of the variance does make that slightly more complicated, but it doesn't, okay, it's not, it's not really too much of an issue. Anyway, what you can do, you can overcome the variance problem by just basically making the rewards that people offered uh, occur on a much more frequent basis. So if you look at, say, um, uh, Casper, so the, the proof of stake currency that the, the Ethereum guys are looking to implement right now, okay, then you have, <clears throat> it's not one reward every 10 minutes, it's maybe like a, a thousand rewards every two seconds or so, okay, so the level of variance then it decreases to the point where it's not really relevant anymore anyway. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Sorry, you, Bernard, okay. Isn't all this focus on the security of the distributed protocol barking up the wrong tree? I mean, the, isn't it much more likely that the interface to the real currency, I mean, how to then, I mean, convert your bitcoins into pounds or dollars is much more likely to be the weaker link in the whole, whole construction? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you, you should focus on that as well. Right? If people, you know, have, uh, have bugs in the wallets that they're using, then their, their currency could be stolen. That's, I think that's, okay, that's an equally important issue, let's say. I mean, I think you're, you're right to, to, to highlight that. Thank you. Uh, what's your perspective on the Mimblewimble protocol and all of this new kind of, I don't know if you've seen, with the privacy coins that have been launched recently, like Grin and a few other ones. Do you think that, that because they say they kind of solve scalability in a way because of the cryptography involved, do you think that's bizarre got potential or? Uh, the, the minimal Wimble protocol. I, the I'm, Mimble -wimble. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not familiar Mimble -wimble. with that, that particular one, I'm afraid. Uh, okay. Generally, though, I mean, okay, the, the issue of, of privacy is, is certainly an, an interesting one, and then coins like them, Zcash and that sort of thing. Um, of course, people often make the mistake of thinking that they, they can trade in Bitcoin and everything they're doing is entirely anonymous, and that the, the transaction can never be traced to them, right? Which, which is a mistake because, in fact, every trade you make in Bitcoin is recorded for everybody to see and for all time, right? So it's not anonymous; it's pseudonymous. Uh, and in fact, there are, you know, there are ways that people can trace who's been doing which trade by, I guess, tracing IP addresses, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, so there are, there are uh, currencies like Zcash, which offer uh, greater degrees of privacy. Then, I guess, more generally than that, I think that there's the in very interesting question as to what degree of privacy should you want people to, to, uh, to be allowed. Uh, and that's a, that's a difficult line to tread, right? I think most people want a fair, a fair degree of privacy. Like most people want it to be the case that when they buy something from the pharmacy, that other people don't know about it. At the same time, I think most people are happy to accept that, you know, the, the tax man needs to be paid. Most people are happy to accept that you have to be able to ensure that, you know, terrorism isn't being funded via the blockchain, this sort of thing. So ultimately, I think the hope there is that you can use cryptography to ensure that the, the right information is available to the right people. Right? And I think that's, you know, that's something that hasn't, as far as, I'm, as I know, hasn't properly been worked out yet. But uh, that's something I'd be optimistic about. So, <clears throat> so, for example, I mean, you know, you might not want the tax man to be able to see every single transaction you're doing, but maybe they should be able to see your total income for the year, that sort of thing. Okay, so my, I guess my hope would be that the cryptography can, can be developed at a point where the right information is available to the right, the right people. I'll see three more hands, so let's go for these, and then kind of, I think we more or less start rounding it up a bit. Yes, please. Thanks for a very interesting discussion. Um, do you think there will be one blockchain to rule them all, or will there be um, use case specific applications, for example, Bitcoin as a store of value, and then other ones, for example, for smart contract applications? Yeah, okay. Uh, but again, so the difficult point there is, is, is always the human elements. It's so difficult to predict humans and what they'll do. So I've already been, I've already talked a little bit about my thoughts on the future of Bitcoin. Uh, and from what I was saying before was, okay, I, I can't predict long term you know, whether Bitcoin will survive and whether Bitcoin will be the wrong currency to rule them all and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, again, from what I was saying before, I think long term my bet would be on a, a proof of stake protocol. Um, and I think... Also, there are, there, are, you know, there are multiple situations in which there are layer two protocols that you, you would want to implement, which will be easier to implement on top of currencies which have a Turing complete scripting language, right? So ultimately, my, my bet would be if there is going to be one 
currency to rule them all. It should be a proof of stake protocol, which has a Turing complete scripting language. Um, does that answer your question to a certain extent? Or, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. okay, good. There's a, there was one gentleman more in there. Now the microphone is almost there. Thanks. Yeah, so um, you were talking about lightning uh, networks. Mm. So is it possible to like stack lightning networks on top of each other? So you have one going from the main blockchain and one going from that lightning network and basically branching out lightning networks so that insignificant or well smaller transactions can be done on like uh, a lightning network that is quite a few lightning networks away from the main blockchain. So, okay, there are various situations in which you might want to stack things, okay? So I didn't get a chance today to talk about side chains, but so for example, you might want to implement a side chain on top of your, your main blockchain. So side chain for those who, okay, is rather like, a, it's another blockchain which is kind of implemented on top of your main blockchain, which somehow uses the security of the main blockchain in order to, in order to, to be secure. So there are various situations which you might want to build a side, a side chain and there may be versions of the Lightning Network or other state channel implementations on top of that. I can't see exactly why you would want to do lightning networks on top of lightning networks, because there you basically already have the transaction rates, right? You, you, you're, you're already basically limited only by your, 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 your internet connectivity. Uh, so maybe you could, but I'm not immediately clear as to what the motivation would be, but maybe I'm missing, missing a point. I was thinking that with the lightning networks, because there's less, there are fewer uh, miners or just there are fewer people on the network, wouldn't it be easier to actually um, fake what's happening on the, uh, the main transaction because, as you said, with the, um, the fact that for a person to take over the network, that they'd have to take over the re uh, they'd have to beat the uh, computational power of the rest of the network. In the Lightning Network itself, isn't it possible for someone to actually? So, if the Lightning Network is implemented properly, then it's the the security is coming from the underlying blockchain. So long as your underlying blockchain is secure, your Lightning, lightning Network is secure. There's, there's no problem with that. Okay, we had one, let, let's call, for the, call it the final question. Uh, hi, thanks very much for the, the talk. Um, I just wanted to clear up something about, um, you were saying about the 5% attack and proof of stake being invulnerable to it effectively, mm -hmm. whereas proof of work would be. Um, and I'm a little bit confused because in my mind, the way you've described it, proof of stake is effectively how much money you own, that's a proportional, uh, how much your power in the network is proportional to how much yeah. money you own. And in proof of work, it's how much computational power you can buy or rent, um, which sounds to me like a proxy for how much money you have. So I just wonder if you clear up fundamentally what is the difference between proof of stake and proof of work, and why is that? How does that change? So, it? Okay, the, the problem is that with the proof of work protocol, okay, the amount of mining that's taking place is only the amount you're paying for. Okay, so the amount of mining that's taking place over a given year-long interval, let's say will only be, let's say, like maybe four or 5% of the total value of the currency, probably less than that, okay? So that's, that's the amount of money I need to spend on hardware in order to repeatedly double spend. With the proof of stake uh, protocol, there, there's just no equivalent of that, right? There's no opportunity for me to buy the mining hardware which is gonna allow me to execute double spends. The way the protocol is set up, will depend on the proof of stake protocol, but probably I require at least a third of the total funds in order to, to double spend. That'll depend on the, the, the particulars of the precise protocol. Okay, but there's just no, there's no equivalent of being able to buy and I spend 5% of the total value of the currency on mining hardware, which will then allow me to, to double spend. And is that that's not the equivalent of having 5% of the currency effectively in, in proof of stake? You, if you have 5% of the currency in proof of stake, then that's nice for you, but you can't double spend. Right? <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no mechanism for you to double spend using a 5% 5, 5 of the stake. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for the question. I'm, I'm, I'm glad there were so many questions.